So this is a recorded version of the assessment presentation I gave on October 29th to the research and instruction librarians at, at Liberty. This recording is meant to provide more information for anyone who is interested in assessment and wants to know more than what I gave in the transfer lecture. So I really like this quote. Kristen Fonticerio said, to be blunt, if librarians are to call themselves teachers, then they too must ensure that students are learning and not just doing. And I strongly agree with this, not just in the instruction classroom, but also with reference. So assessment can have many purposes. The one that we often focus on is because administrators ask for it. Another example would be pre-assessments for assignment design. So in other words, doing some kind of pretest or learning about what the students already know in order to create an assignment. You can assess to show results and value of something that you've already done, such as instruction. You can assess for improvement, which can be either improvement in your teaching immediately to better meet the needs of the students who are right there in front of you, or improvement of your teaching over time. Assessment can help you think like a student, which will help you design lessons better and also communicate better at the reference desk. And there are other reasons to assess, but these are the ones that I came up with as I was brainstorming purposes. But it's important to recognize what the purpose of assessment is in order to pick a way to do it that best meets your need. Another important thing to recognize when doing assessment is that sometimes you need cognitive assessments and sometimes you need affective. So if you were in my transfer presentation, you know that I separate cognitive and affective aspects of learning. So cognitive assessments are, what did the students learn or what are they learning? What can they do and what do they know? Affective or the emotional side of learning also needs to be assessed, including how do they feel about their learning experience and affective assessments can explore motivation, which is a critical part of any learning. Another distinction that is important when talking about assessment is formative versus summative assessments. Formative assessments are in the process of learning assessments. They are guideposts. They are tasting the soup while still in the kitchen before you sit down to the table because you can still change the spices in the soup if something needs to be changed. Formative assessments make student thinking and learning visible in time for you to respond to it as the educator. Formative assessment benefits current students. You don't have to wait to improve with a new batch of students. Formative assessments can help you improve right there on the spot. And it's important to recognize that formative assessments may or may not leave documentation. And when I give you some examples of what formative assessments look like later in this presentation, you'll see what I mean by that. Summative assessments are generally what we think about when we talk about assessment in the library field and often in the education field. They are the end of learning assessments. What did they learn at the end of the process? They are assessing the student's destination. It demonstrates results and value. And you can think of it as a full meal. It's when all of the guests show up and you put the soup on the table and you're not going to change anything. It is what it is. So formative and summative assessments are both extremely important. They complement each other. They serve different purposes. My presentation is going to focus on formative assessment for various reasons, and I think I'll just wait to explain why in a moment here. So in the book that I wrote on formative assessment in library instruction, my co-authors and I wrote, formative assessment allows an instructor to view or have access to knowledge that otherwise may be hidden within the student. So oftentimes formative assessments are looking at the process of learning or the process of doing a research project. And if we left students to their own devices, all of that work would happen in their heads. Formative assessments can help make that thinking visible so that we can encourage what is good and have an opportunity to fix what could be improved. Another thing that I like to say when I talk about formative assessment is formative assessment is active learning with a point. So when I did an in-depth literature review on whether or not librarians have been doing formative assessment over the history of information literacy development, I found that 
There was a ton of literature on active learning and the benefits of active learning, but there was a clear distinction between librarians who used that active learning to be able to see what students were learning and respond to it, and ones that just did active learning and never really discussed what the point of the activity was. So I got interested in formative assessment after I was doing research on game-based learning. And as I started brainstorming, what are some of the key aspects or key qualities of active learning? I realized they lined up really well with the key aspects or qualities of game-based learning. This is a diagram that I made for an article that looked at formative assessment in game-based learning. So in order to have formative assessment, you have to have an environment of active learning. Feedback is the central part of everything. There has to be feedback making a conversation between the learners and the educator. Scaffolding is an important part of formative assessment. Scaffolding is when an instructor asks students to do something with a lot of supports and over the course of time slowly takes those supports away so that students are developing in their mastery and independence. Social learning is really important in both game-based learning and formative assessment. Students learn so much from each other and they can get feedback from other learners. It doesn't always have to be the instructor. And students can do a lot more socially than they can do together. And from that, they learn to be able to do things independently after learning from their peers. Motivation is really important for formative assessment. So when students feel like they are getting feedback in the process, they're getting corrections, they're getting encouragement, they're having that conversation with the instructor through these various activities, there's a lot of research showing that it's a big motivator for students. They know that they're on the right track, that increases their feelings of self-efficacy, and that is motivating. Critical thinking and self-assessment are really important, so that feedback that comes from instructors initially slowly is taken away through that scaffolding process and it becomes critical thinking and self-assessment where students can start to monitor things themselves that once upon a time the educator did. And moratoriums are a safe place to practice. This came from James Paul Gee and he borrows this from an educational theorist, although he took some liberties in changing what it means, but it's a place where students can practice without their grade being harmed or without any major consequences for failure, because failure can be a really great educator, but it ne there needs to be a time where the, f the consequences of failure are not so great before those consequences become important. And then the last thing is stealth assessment. So in formative assessment, students often do not realize that they are being assessed. They think the educator is just checking in on them, and so they don't necessarily see it as an assessment. By far the most important text on formative assessment in higher education is Classroom Assessment Techniques, a handbook for college educators by Angelo and Cross. This is a really, really great book. Hopefully you have it in your library. We had it in ours before I started doing this research and I found it to be really useful. There's a very satisfying introduction before it goes into 50 classroom assessment techniques. The actual 50 techniques don't necessarily work for librarians. Some of them do, some of them don't, some of them can with adaptation, but that introduction has some really great information and this could be useful to you if you start to work with faculty because this was designed for the way faculty teach over the course of a semester. So when I say that the Angelo and Cross book doesn't necessarily work for librarians, it's because librarians do most of our instruction through one-shots. And formative assessment techniques designed for instructors that have access to students over the course of a semester don't necessarily work for one-shots. So some of the drawbacks of one-shots as far as doing formative assessment, the biggest one is time constraints. If we just have that hour, we have to find formative assessment activities that work within that hour. Formative assessment requires feedback, so within time constraints, feedback can be difficult. And then knowing students can be difficult. 
because faculty start to learn what the class personality is at the beginning of the year and students' individual needs. And when we walk into a one-shot, we don't know the students. We don't know what they individually or collectively need from us in that hour. We have to learn that during that hour. But we do have one major advantage for formative assessment in that we are really a non-threatening environment. We don't usually give them grades. There's usually in our activities room to fail and learn through failure. So something that may be a challenge for educators if they're used to having all activities assigned as a grade may be a lot more natural for librarians. So the key to making formative assessment work for one shots is finding activities that work within the constraints that we work with. So I'm going to start by giving you some examples. I found it really useful to distinguish between before, during, and after formative assessment activities. So for example, in a before activity, students could complete a pretest before coming to your class. This would be in conjunction with a, or in collaboration with a professor. You could use those pretest results to design the lesson. This is something that I do in an English composition class where the professor assigns them a pretest the first week of class, and then I use those results as the basis of how I do my lesson plan when I meet them in week three or four. During the class, students could use clickers to demonstrate what they know or understand, and you can modify your instruction based on their results. So again, this is something that I use in several of the classes, including that composition class. When I see them the second time, I ask them some questions. There are for first a few review questions, then there's some questions that get them to look up information on the handout for matching the right database with the topic that they might select within the assignment. And then I have some where I just want them to guess an answer. And then we talk about, okay, where would you find this information? Where would you find health statistics or public opinion information? So I modify my instruction based on what they say in the moment there. And when I looked at the literature on use of clickers and whether or not librarians liked them or educators liked them, the ones who liked them had used them for formative assessment and the ones who did not like them didn't use that information from the students to inform their lesson. And an after activity, again, this being with collaboration with the faculty member, students could complete a worksheet that you provide timely feedback on and return back to them, perhaps returning it to the professor who returns it to them so that they can see your feedback. So here are some example activities for before instruction. And if you're interested in this, you can pause this and look this up. These are all described in my book called Snapshots of Reality, if you wish to find out more information. And these are just some of the activities that I have in that book. So here are some activities for during instruction. This is where we have the most control of our lesson plans. This doesn't necessarily require any collaboration with the faculty. Most of these are things where you can conduct and respond to the results right away. And then here are some examples of after instruction. And many of these are things that instructors may do to break up the research paper process. And for librarians, the question is just getting access to that and being able to participate and give feedback to students on their work as a librarian. So some of these require expanding beyond the one shot, and this requires collaboration with faculty. So for example, flipped classrooms in that English composition class, they watch some library tutorials and do some brief quizzes online, and then they have some of that content before coming to see me in person. And that gives them more time to look for sources while the professor and I are in the room and able to help them. Also, technology can help us expand beyond the one shot. If we don't have face-to-face -face access to students, we may be able to use technology to expand our access. For example, we may be able to respond to them by email. Another option for expanding beyond the one shots is curriculum mapping. There's different ways of doing this. There's some literature on it. In some cases, librarians work with a particular department to put different information literacy skills in at different levels of a departmental curriculum. 
or the library can spread out information literacy skills over the course of students' careers so that there are some introductory skills that they try to incorporate in first year classes. Juniors and sophomores may have a different list of information literacy skills, and then seniors or capstone classes may have some higher order skills. And I've seen this done with the standards at Gettysburg. I don't know if they've updated it with the framework, but they said it really worked for them and they have a really impressive program. That is entirely in the control of librarians, although collectively the librarians need to develop that together. So another option for expanding me on the one shots is for credit information literacy instruction. So you would have access to students over the course of the semester or at least some part of the semester mm. as it is taught at some institutions. It's my understanding that Liberty does not do this and neither does Lycoming. I am a little skeptical of teaching information literacy outside of the context of a course or discipline. However, there are people I really respect who do say that this works very well for them. So I have mentioned that technology can help expand access to students when you don't have face-to-face -face time scheduled with them beyond the one shot. It can also help you process information from formative assessment activities very quickly. So some examples include clickers and poll everywhere. So in the past I've used clickers and as we have moved to hybrid instruction where sometimes the students are away and sometimes they're in person and even when they're in person we don't want them touching collective clickers um, i've moved to poll everywhere it can be free and students can use their own cell phones from wherever they are whether they're tuning in via zoom or whether they're in the classroom they can use their own phones to respond to clicker questions. And then as an instructor, I can respond to however they answer the questions. Word clouds allow students to input a chunk of text. You can combine all of those chunks of text to create a visual word cloud that has the words that were used the most frequently larger so that you can draw some conclusions about what words are being used based on those word clouds. Blog Comments can be quickly skimmed through. Also, you can create a class blog where they can contribute. Google Forms can do a lot of things. You can turn a form into a quiz and you can use them to make tutorials interactive if you don't have the software to make interactive tutorials or if you want a record and your software for interactive tutorials doesn't allow for that. There are interactive tutorial softwares that you can use online quizzes that may not be Google Forms, feedback facilitation tools. So there's a, a lot of different ways that technology can facilitate feedback beyond the ones that I've given you right here. Um, plagiarism detection software such as Turnitin can be used for formative assessment. And location-based assignments can use technology such as QR codes or some kind of code that you plug into some online system that allows students to progress in the tutorial or somehow prove that they were at a location. I just want to very quickly mention Backwards Design. This is by Wiggins and Mateek. This is a great book, really useful information. The central idea of Backwards Design is that you start by identifying the desired results. So this may be learning outcomes, this may be your description of what you want students to be able to do at the end of a lesson. This may be the outcome of a collaboration. So this doesn't just have to be for instruction design, it can be for other design projects. Then the second step is determine acceptable evidence. So how, what are you gonna do for assessment? And then not until after you determine these two things, do you start actually planning learning experiences and instruction? I find this to be critical to start with the desired results and work backwards. Oftentimes I kind of work back and forth between that second and third step, but assessment comes earlier in the process. It's not the last thing that is designed. Formative assessments tend to be small things, quick, creative, they can be fun. They can also be combined in various ways to create programmatic assessment. So it could be that, that everybody in a library program norms how they grade student work and puts it into one big system. Or it could be, this is something that we did 
successfully one semester. We have not done it since, but it did work and has a lot of potential. We picked two or three learning outcomes to focus on. They weren't the only things that we assessed during the semester, but we pulled out those particular assessments, submitted them to me, and I looked at all of them and created a narrative for indiv the individual instructors and then one for the whole program based on the evidence that we had from these student assessments. So it is possible to take these little pieces, so like puzzle pieces, each of these puzzle pieces representing this small activity in and of itself. It d might not say that much, but when you start to put it together, it can form a more comprehensive assessment of the program. Ideally, you are working towards a culture of assessment. Meredith Farkas has written a great article about culture of assessment. There are some other good articles on cultures of assessment where assessment is expected. It is built into the institutional culture. When decisions have to be made, everybody says, okay, what does our assessment show we should do in this decision-making process? So it is built into the fabric of the institutional culture. And to end this presentation, I want to go over six commandments. I'm going to say that in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way, but I was thinking about what do I really want to stress at the end of this presentation, some bare basics of assessment. The first one is don't ask things you don't want to know. So for example, if you ask students, did I do a good job as your instructor today? If you don't want to hear them tell you no, then you shouldn't ask the question. You should be prepared that you might not like the answer when you ask a question. So if you don't want to know something, don't ask. Or at least if you have to ask, emotionally prepare yourself for possibly not liking the answer. Second goes along with this, don't ask things you don't care about. So I'm surprised when I read about other people's assessments or when I'm forced to ask about things that I don't care about in a standardized assessment. It's really frustrating to have to process information that I don't care about, I don't see the value of. You should do something with the results and design your assessments so that you will do something with the results. You may make changes in the program. You may make changes in your instruction. It may influence your design. It may influence future assessments, but you should design your assessments with some kind of action planned. Number four, use student reports of learning in context. There have been some studies that compared what students think they've learned to what cognitive assessments showed that they learned, and they found that there really wasn't a correlation. If you ask students, did you learn a lot in this session, you can use that as an affective assessment to see, did they have a good learning experience? But it's not a cognitive assessment. It's not an accurate view of how much they learned just because they said they learned. Number five, ease into assessment. That's one of the beautiful things about formative assessment is you can do really little things that you do spontaneously that leave no evidence, that require no collaboration with faculty members, and you can level up all the way to combining all of these into a programmatic assessment. But if you're not used to doing a whole lot with assessment, don't try to model what you do with some of the stuff that, for example, Megan Oakley writes about. She's got a PhD, most of the rest of us don't. Those might be something that your program works up to, but don't set that as your threshold when you're first starting out with assessment. Focus on that formative assessment and work your way up to larger assessments. And this last one is one that I really want to stress. Do what you find useful preemptively. So if you preemptively do what you find useful, you're less likely to be told by administrators or by accrediting bodies how to do your assessment, which you may find less useful than if you had designed it originally. So here are some suggested readings. There's my book, Snapshots of Reality, that I wrote with two co-authors. Shortly after that was published, then Melissa Bowles Terry and her co-author wrote Classroom Assessment Techniques for Librarians. I feel like these two books complement each other. Mine's theory and activities, and theirs is focused on case studies. 
And then this article is the one that got me interested in formative assessment for library instruction by Michelle Dunaway and Teague Orblich, both wonderful people. I was so excited to read this and so disappointing when I found out that it was the only thing I could find that really focused on formative assessment in library instruction. So since I couldn't find that much in libraries, I expanded beyond libraries. And these are the most useful resources I found. Black and Willem's article, Inside the Black Box, really, really good starting resource on what is formative assessment. It's a classic. The next one is Fisher and Phrase, Checking for Understanding. And then Harada and Yoshina's Assessing for Learning. The Assessing for Learning was written by school librarians, so it does have a library perspective, although the activities are for much younger students and not necessarily applicable to higher education. Really good resources here. And that is the end of this presentation. I am always available if you have questions, want to know more information, want more suggestions for reading, just contact me, email, phone, whatever, and I'll be happy to help you in your exploration of assessment.